And we're back. Welcome back to Fossil Creek Nursery's continuing series of live stream and in-person plant talks. Today we are going to be talking about common tree diseases. My name is Dan Hartwig, Colorado Certified Nursery Professional. I'll tell you right away, this talk is going to come with a lot of disclaimers. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is what should my decision making process be if I notice my tree may have a disease? Well, I'll tell you right away, your certified nursery professional is a good first contact. But tree disease is a complicated is a complicated problem, a complicated process, especially if we're going to be uh, choosing to apply fungicides, insecticides, or herbicides. So like I said, your certified nursery professional, great first point of contact. Just like a medical problem though, do not take my word for it. If I ever, if myself, any of my coworkers, anyone working at a nursery give you a diagnosis of a plant problem, always get a second opinion. This is important. Um, pesticides are, are when used incorrectly can have serious consequences and also trees are not inexpensive things. We've invested money, time and effort into these. Like I said, your certified nursery professional may very well be your first point of contact, but always, always get a second opinion from your county extension agent. What's a county extension agent, Dan? Well, just remember, every single land grant college in the country, meaning they were given free land in order to uh, run a university, is required, required by law to run a horticulture and agriculture extension office in order to give free advice to, in the old days, the farmers, now still the farmers, plus give advice in, uh, in consumer horticulture. All right. Now, who should I never, ever contact with a, with a tree problem? The answer is your tree service. They are going to sell you something. They are going to sell you something whether you need it or not. I don't want to speak ill of tree services, but their job is to sell their services. Do not hire a tree service without independently getting a diagnostic from both your certified nursery professional and your extension agent to make sure that this is in, correct, in fact the problem I have and also to recommend a course of treatment. Your last step in this process should be a tree service. Okay, so Hippocrates, an ancient Greek, the father of medicine, his first rule is do no harm. Do no harm. Doctors swear the Hippocratic Oath. They raise their right hand, I'd imagine, and I bet that, that oath starts with do no harm. Same thing with us as uh, in consumer or horticulture, do no harm. The three don'ts of tree problems, this, this is the three don'ts of all plant problems. Rule number one, don't prune. Rule number two, don't fertilize. Rule number three, don't panic. Talk to your certified nursery professional, talk to your extension agent. They will tell you if it in fact is the right time to break any of those three rules. If it is time to fertilize, if it is time to prune, or if it is time to panic. Now, listen guys, friends, I know, I use Dr. Google. I, 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 I'm, I am guilty as the rest of us, and usually Dr. Google will give us a frightening diagnosis. Now, if you must use Dr. Google, always add .edu to that search. For example, what dread disease does my tree have? Add .edu, so at least you're getting an academic source, preferably your, uh, your local extension office. Okay, so let's talk about how to diagnose tree diseases. First of all, it's important to know that tree diseases can be broadly categorized into one of two situations. Situation number one, this is 90%. About 90% of the tree problems are abiotic, meaning they are not caused by an insect or a disease. 
they are caused by the correct combination of a host plant and unfavorable conditions. Those are the two things we need for an abiotic disease. Host plant, unfavorable conditions. Again, about 90% of tree problems are diagnosed as biotic, meaning insect, fungus, or disease. But about 90% of tree products are in fact abiotic, meaning they are not going to be treated with fungicide, insecticide, fertilizer. All right, what are the most common abiotic tree problems? Well, salt damage. Um, if your tree is near a road where they're using magnesium chloride, your tree could suffer from salt damage. Um, I'm going to encourage you to go on an academic site, look at pictures of all of these conditions. If you think they are affecting your tree, the best way to get an idea, could I be on right track, is to type in Austrian pine salt damage dot edu. Now, if you type in, does my Austrian pine have salt damage? I guarantee one of the first links that hits that comes up will be a tree company, and they will tell you absolutely yes, only we can solve it, and boy, it's going to cost you. A lot of tree problems can be solved without buying a single thing from me, or certainly from hiring a tree service. Okay. Salt damage also can be caused by overuse of petrochemical fertilizers. Um, I discourage the use, excessive use of petrochemical fertilizers in, uh, in plantings, and also I discourage the use of animal manure-based compounds, pardon me, based composts. The problem with those is if you introduce salts into our soil, our soil is so dense and poorly drained that salt stays in there almost indefinitely, and sometimes you can even see a precipitate of salt on the top of your planting. Okay. Abiotic problem number two, this is the one that we diagnose and get the most questions here at Fossil Creek Nursery, is iron chlorosis. Well, strange thing about our soil is actually, actually it's got a decent amount of iron in it. However, our soil is so alkaline, it becomes chemically unavailable to the plant. Signs of iron chlorosis, we see it in oaks and maples more than any other trees, specifically hybrids of uh, silver and red maples, Acer freemanii, and uh, silver maples. Uh, the sign you're going to see is yellow leaves with green veins running through them. The problem is because of the lack of uptake of iron in that tree, you are, uh, it is, does not have the, the chemistry necessary for the process of creating chlorophyll. Now, I'll tell you right away, any treatment for iron chlorosis is going to be expensive, it's going to have to be consistently done, and you're going to get temporary results at best. I'm going to say this about a lot of things. A lot of times, the uh, best solution from this is to choose a plant that is adapted to your soil condition rather than trying to adapt your soil condition to that plant. You have heard me preach the gospel of soil testing before. If I was to plant something like a chinkapin oak or a, or a, a Freeman maple, the first thing I would do is send a soil sample off to CSU Extension. We're going to put the link in the description. Um, the basic panel costs 40 bucks. It will save you a lot of heartbreak and a lot of expense in the, in the uh, long run. And if you ask for an amendment plan or just ask the question, do you think it's a good idea to plant this certain tree there? They will give you a, a uh, brutally honest answer. Okay. Third uh, abiotic problem we're seeing a lot is leaf scorch. Well, I'll tell you right away, we're not seeing it this spring because somehow we have swapped weather here in the northern front range with the Pacific Northwest. We are having the rainiest uh, spring a lot of us can remember. We are not seeing much drought stress or leaf scorch. Um, there is no hard and fast set of rules I can tell you about how to water to avoid drought stress. The most important thing is give up on trying to figure out how much water to give my plant. Give it a lot. The most important thing is to figure out how often should I water. That is much easier to figure out than how much to water. Okay, opposite of that, and we're starting to see a little bit this spring, is oxygen asphyxia. This is symptoms of overwatering. Remember, Plants can only get nutrients from the soil 
through tiny little hair-like structures on the end of their uh, feeder roots called cilla. If they are constantly submerged, that plant cannot get water and nutrients from the oxygen and nutrients from the soil. Um, plants feed most effectively when those little feeder hairs on those feeder roots are just about to dry out. That's a state we, can, we call field capacity. The only way that we can do that as growers is to replicate the natural drench and then dry cycles. Give that plant a lot of water, but let it dry out a little bit between waterings. Last uh, common abiotic problem we're seeing is herbicide injury. Uh, this can be caused both by selective herbicides, example 2,4-D, you know, weed killer in uh, lawn fertilizer, does not kill uh, turf grass, but kills broadleaf weeds. Guess what? That uh, The compounds in 2,4-D do not know the difference between bindweed and your autumn blaze maple. They are both broadleaf plants. Um, use caution when applying selective herbicides around plants you want to keep. Um, as always, if I sell you an herbicide, read, follow, and understand the instructions, including the instructions for the correct protective clothing to wear while applying that herbicide. It will never be shorts and flip-flops. Non-selective herbicides, such as uh, glyphosate, um, when applied indiscriminately or without caution, can also cause herbicide damage. Um, people love to blame their neighbors on, uh, on herbicide injury. I am, I am not willing to uh, diagnose that and uh, create a conflict between you and your neighbor, but be considerate neighbors when you are applying herbicides. Okay, most important thing for all of these abiotic problems, proper plant choice. It is so much easier and more, and more effective to select plants that are adapted to our challenging growing conditions, that are adapted to, to road salts, that are adapted to the, our alkaline soils and difficulty in iron intake, that are uh, drought tolerant, that are tolerant of wet uh, planting spots if that you have that, even uh, plants that are uh, tolerant of herbicide injury. Remember, right plant, right place, it is much easier, more effective, and you'll be a happier grower by selecting plants suited to your site rather than spending lots of time, money, and energy trying to adapt your site to that plant you had back home. For you newcomers, I always welcome you to the Northern Front Range. We are glad you're here. All right. Biotic problems, meaning they are caused by an insect, pathogen, or fungus. We need three things to make that happen. We need a parasitic organism, we need a host plant, and we need the right environment. So, What can I do about that? Well, I'll tell you right away, we'll just start by... Uh, by uh, talking about some common biotic problems we're seeing this, this year, and then we're going to talk about what to do if my plant does have either an abiotic or biotic problem. I would be uh, neglecting my duties if I didn't talk about the emerald ash borer. All right, so the emerald ash borer is an invasive insect, probably imported uh, accidentally from China on dunnage, meaning the packing material for, for uh, cargo. It is affecting members of the Fraxinus family, uh, purple ash, green ash, and also um, white fringe trees. The state forester of Colorado is, has predicted that we could lose up to 30% of the shade trees in northern Colorado because of the emerald ash borer. Um, well, why, why so many? Because tell you right away, friends, it was, it's a great tree. Ash, especially things like the autumn purple, are gorgeous landscape trees. They have amazing fall color, great canopy shape. They, they grow fast. They, before this came along, they did not seem to have a lot of serious biotic or abiotic problems. And of course, as a result, just like the elms of the 1970s, which were taken out by Dutch elm disease, they were overplanted. You put too many of the same host organism in too tight a space, you are going to get a disease that starts taking them out. All right, so what do I do if I have an ash tree? Um, most important thing, remember, always get a second opinion. 
If you think your tree is infested by the emerald ash borer, it is very important that you, do, that you uh, show those photographs, show those cuttings to your extension agent or to get in touch with the uh, Office of the State Forester. Those links will be down in the description. So Dan, I have an ash tree. I love it. It's happy. It's healthy. What am I going to do about that? Well, let's talk about the other one. First of all, if you have an ash tree that is infested with the emerald ash borer, it's done for. You can't treat it. Take it out. Get it removed. Sooner the better. Um, it, will tr you will, it will cost less to have it taken out before it starts deteriorating. If you have an ash tree that's in the wrong spot, for example, under power lines, too close to a road, too cl close to a structure, have it taken out. Now, say I have an ash tree I like. What am I going to do? Well, if it's under 15 inch diameter, um, in the case of ash trees, we're going to use something we call the breast height measurement. You're going to do it at chest level. Stand up to that tree at chest level, get out your tape. If that tree has a diameter at chest height of less than 15 inches, you can treat it as a homeowner. Come, come see us and we can uh, recommend the, cor the correct product. Whenever I sell you, if you notice, I am not showing any pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides during this. Uh, that is totally outside the scope of, uh, of this talk. We're more talking about diagnosis and recognition of plant diseases than uh, treatment. But you can uh, treat them as a homeowner. Uh, it'll be significantly less expensive than hiring a tree service. Now, if you have an ash tree you want to keep with a breast height measurement of over 15 inches, you're going to have to hire a professional for that. The over-the-counter product I sell, that's not an on-label use. We cannot sell you a product for a insect or disease or host plant that is off-label. That's why you're going to see us opening up those instructions in the back, looking over our glasses because of our age. A lot of the times I'll just uh, pull it up on the computer because it's in a legible print. Don't ever buy a pesticide from a nursery for something that's an off-label use. Along those lines, avoid garden hacks, avoid garden folklore. If it has to do with dish soap, beer, um, Epsom salts, uh, Doc Bronner's Magic Soap, it's, it's great stuff, just not for horticulture uses. Um, those things haven't been reviewed by peer-reviewed uh, scientific trials. These, uh, these pesticides we sell, they have been. Remember, on-label use only. Okay, emerald ash borer. Next, next common disease we're seeing this year is rust. We have diagnosed more species of rust than I ever remember. This is my sixth season here. What's rust? Well, rust is a fungus. Um, affects leaves. Um, some species of trees are more vulnerable than others, especially fruit trees. Um, aspens, we're seeing that on hawthorns, seeing it on peaches. Now, in severity, you know, one being the sniffles, 10 being a bull of Zaire, rust is a two. Rust is concerning but not alarming. Rust can be treated with good cultural practices, and I'll talk about what that means shortly, and um, with use on label use of fungicides. Okay, fire blight. Um, fire blight is a serious disease. It is too early in the season for us to have been diagnosing it yet, but we will be diagnosing fire blight before this season is out. Fire blight affects uh, trees in the apple, peach, pear, hawthorn, uh, plum. Fire blight is caused by a uh, bacteria. It can be treated with a, um, a streptomycin product and with some selective pruning. Uh, if you think that your tree is suffering from fire blight, the uh, two symptoms and signs you should look for are it will almost look like someone has taken a cigarette lighter and scorched the margin of your leaves. And also you will see uh, twigs and stems curled up into a shepherd's hook shape. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to give you my opinion about what it is. That's all it is. It's opinion. It's not a diagnosis. I do not have a degree in plant pathology. However, your extension agent does have a master's degree in plant pathology. Do not consider a diagnosis unless it's from your extension agent. It is a recommendation it's from, if it's from your nursery professional. 
it can be treated with both co a combination of cultural and uh, chemical. All right, we're seeing a lot of cys cytospora canker fungus uh, this year. Again, it's because of the wet weather. It's because of bad cultural practices, overhead watering and splashback from mud. This is super easy to, uh, con to avoid, friends. Mulch everything you plant, not rock, not soil, not turf grass, mulch. Keeps that mud from splattering back up and uh, spreading fungus onto your plants. Another fungal disease. Um, this one, however, significantly more difficult to control. Um, get a, get a, a second opinion from your extension agent. Finally, the, the, the plant problem we see the most is, is chewing damage from aphids. Um, aphids are endemic in home landscapes, meaning you will have aphids. If you have an aphid-free landscape, it's because you have drastically been using, uh, overusing insecticides and have really just nuked the ecosystem of your, uh, of your landscape. Um, never spray preventatively for anything. What that's doing is that's creating a generation of insecticide uh, resistant uh, insects. You must learn as a home grower in consumer horticulture to accept a certain amount of insect infestation. Um, if the damage is minor, 5% of your, your plant, I wouldn't even treat it. Otherwise, you're going to be just, you're going to have ex basically you're spraying expensive stuff on the leaves in order to uh, create a generation of insecticide resistant aphids. Um, remember, they're, they're doing uh, damage through chewing. Uh, be acceptant of a certain amount of damage. The sign and symptom to look for is cupped leaves that look to, that look to have little yellow or, or green masses on them. All right, so we haven't talked a whole lot about insecticides for, for a reason. Just remember, you, you're a uh, your nursery professional Basically, all I'm allowed to do by state law is tell you to read the instructions. Get a diag If you get a diagnosis from me, it's a recommendation. Get a diagnosis from your uh, city forester or extension agent. Whenever you buy an insect, a pesticide from your nursery, make sure it's an on-label use for both the pest and the host plant. Read, understand, and follow the instructions, including the correct protective clothing. So what's to be done about this? We've got, you, 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 you've talked about five dread biotic and five dread abiotic problems we're seeing. Well, preventative care is the best thing we can do and that's what we call plant health care. Here are the four rules of plant health care. Number one, pick host resistant plants. Pick If I want to get a crab apple or an apple tree, Get fire blight resistant cultivars. Better yet, if I, you've got a if you've got a um, history of fire blight in your landscape, don't plant a plant something that is entirely outside of uh, the plants that uh, that that get fire blight. Get a uh, get a, a a Japanese maple tree. Great ornamental tree. Fire does not susceptible to fire blight. So host resistance. Number two, eradication and sa sanitation. Well, how do I er eradicate and sanitize my plants? Well, the most important thing we need to do is scouting. Be out there hand watering, inspecting. Don't use the fire and forget irrigation system. Be out there no less than once a week, giving your plants a look over. The quicker you catch the signs and symptoms of a disease, the more effectively you can treat it. Your automatic irrigation system does not care if your plant is being devoured by aphids or fire blight. You do. Get out there. Scout it. Scout at dusk with your flashlight or your headlamp. That's when the destructive insects are active. Sanitation, what do I mean by that? Well, good cultural practices. Say that I do have rust. Um, Sometimes you're going to get the recommendations like, well, you have, you have a mild case of rust. I don't think it's worth uh, treating it with a fungicide. Here's what you are going to do, though. When that plant drops its leaves in the fall, don't compost them. Don't mulch them on the, rake them up and landfill them. That's what I mean by good sanitation. 
Number three, avoidance. Never buy a sickly nurse looking plant from a nursery. Never buy a sickly looking plant from the box store. Um, do not take, if you are if you are sold a chemical along with a plant because of the disease that it currently has, actually we are breaking the law. I am not allowed to sell you a plant that has signs or symptoms of a disease or insect infestation. Avoidance, get your plants from a good source. Finally, good cultural practices, correct watering, correct pruning, correct removal of detritus, meaning debris, sanitizing your tools, keeping your tools sharp. These are the keys of uh, plant health care. All right, last thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to throw even more warnings at you. Should you decide to buy a pesticide, it should be on the recommendation of the state forester, pardon me, a city forester or your, um, your extension agent. I would discourage you from making your own diagnosis. If you get a diagnosis from me, get a second opinion. I do not have a master's degree in plant in plant pathology your extension agent does all right you must use the correct pesticide it must be an on label use make sure you see the word giant giant conifer aphid we diagnosed our first case of that this year they're pretty gross if you have giant conifer aphids you will know it real quickly make sure that's an on label use make sure your plant is an on label use if you have an Austrian pine, make sure it says Pinus nigra in uh, the acceptable plants. More is not better. Use, read, understand, follow the instructions, including the protective clothing and the uh, intervals between using this. Also, if this is a food crop, look at the interval between application and harvest. Finally, shop by active ingredient not brand name um the uh pesticides we sell here uh the brand name is not the brand name you're gonna buy at the box store but the the active ingredient is the same if i had my way the active ingredient would be the name brand it would for example it would be it would be acetaminophen by tylenol ibuprofen by advil imidacloprid by fertilome not the other way around. The trade names don't mean anything. Read those active ingredients. Make sure it's an on-label use. And finally, again, read, understand, follow the instructions. All right. Hey, it means a lot to us that you keep on joining us for our plant talks. Uh, come see us soon at Fossil Creek Nursery. If you have any questions, shoot us an email or give us a phone call. Be safe out there. Thank you.